Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this introduction to the, uh, the Washington uh, model tool for screening for biased content and in instructional materials. My name is Barbara Suits. I am the Open Educational Resources and Instructional Materials Program Manager here at OSPI. And I am joined by my colleagues today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Sarah Albertson. I am the Managing Attorney of the Equity and Civil Rights Office at OSPI. Hello, my name is Arlene Crum, and I'm the Director of Mathematics here at OSPI. Hi, I'm Laurie Dills. I'm the Sexual Health Education Program Supervisor at OSPI. And hello, my name is Era Jackson. I am the Director of English Language Arts and Literacy here at OSPI. We're now going to go through the background and purpose of this tool and further on through this webinar we'll be looking at the different components and criteria that compose the tool. So first let's look at the purpose of this tool. The purpose is two-pronged, to adhere and meet the expectations of Washington state law and also to provide um, you educators, schools, and districts with guiding questions on how to review instructional materials and recognize bias um, in the instructional materials that may impact student learning, development, pride, and sense of belonging and empowerment. Though this screening tool is geared towards the review of instructional materials, we also encourage you to use it to look at your supplemental and intervention resources along with your core, and instru core instructional materials. Furthermore, this work should be embedded in the larger district and community efforts on focusing on anti-racism, culturally responsive and sustaining education and inclusion. And finally, as we think about this, I ask you to, I encourage you to look at this final quote of what does it mean for all of our students to have the opportunity to be seen, acknowledged and valued as they go through our K-12 system. Next, we're gonna look at how this document and the um, was created and the development process. We originally created this first, the first iteration of this document in 2009. And over the years, over the past decade, we've asked, we've heard from a lot of people who have asked for this document to be updated. And so here we are. Um, what we first started off with our learning and teaching department, looking and thinking about what could be changed. And then we brought in all of our agency partners, such as you can see our equity and civil rights office, our office of native ed, our migrant office and our center for improvement of um, student learning. We then went through many iterations of revisions and for asked um, external agency uh, asked for external agency feedback so that we can improve this to the best of our ability. We, this ability, this document cobbles together resources from all over the country, such as Teaching Tolerance, Southern Poverty Law Center, the Anti-Defamation League, um, a, a variety of tools we tried to bring together into one really great resource for Washington, for Washington Washington schools and districts. Um, I would be remiss to say that this is also a living document. We want to be able to look back and think, how do we make this a living, breathing document to reflect our more deeper and more advanced understanding as we think about what instructional materials should look like for the students in our rich and diverse um, Washington community. So stay tuned as we think about what we, how we'll be select getting feedback and how we'll be doing those regular updates. Next, I'm going to pass it back to Barbara, who will walk you through the different components of the tool. Thanks, Sarah. I'll be talking just a little bit about the strategy for actually using this screening tool with your district as you're reviewing instructional materials. As you all know, an evaluation of content for bias is a required portion of your district's instructional material selection and adoption process. The way that this screening tool was designed was assuming that you or your review team more specifically is conducting a bias review as part of, of that larger process. That said, though, we hope that the criteria that are presented here also help guide selection of supplemental or intervention resources or even the review of your existing instructional materials. Before we launch into more details about how and when to use this screening tool, let me take just a moment to let you know where to find it. First, this resource is part of OSPI's Instructional Materials Toolkit, 
This toolkit outlines suggested steps and highlights promising practices in the instructional materials adoption process. Most importantly, it provides model resources like this one. The resource can also be found on OSPI's equity and civil rights page uh, that deals with reviewing materials for bias and on the Washington OER hub. I'll put links to all of these sites underneath the video. There will also be a link to the slide deck so that you can just click on the live links in the presentation. What you see on the left is an example of one of the resources in the Instructional Materials Toolkit. Um, this one is designed to help districts involved in the selection and adoption process. Uh, in particular, this one is from a math adoption example, but the steps should be the same for any content area. The screening tool really comes into play during several parts of this process. Um, the most obvious is, of course, step number four, the review and selection of core instructional materials. Uh, here is where reviewers need to examine both alignment to learning standards and tar target district priorities, um, as well as screening for biased content. But just as importantly for successful implementation of this tool, district teams will really need to explore the resource and understand the criteria during step three preparing for the review. The need is great for reviewers to understand what biased content looks like. Professional learning is critical, not only around how to identify different types of bias, but also how to spot material that has cultural relevance and diverse representation. As with your academic content review prep, time spent having rich conversations and providing your team with extended learning opportunities around these areas is critical. So let's take a closer look at the specific strategy for screening for biased content. Uh, first of all, the team will need to choose which materials to analyze. Core instructional material can be thousands of pages, so review teams will need to select a few grades, units, and lessons to really focus in on. If possible, you're gonna to wanna to select at least one lower and one upper grade. Also, be sure to take a look at some instructor-facing materials like teacher guides. The next step requires engaging the review team in professional learning. Uh, we spoke about this just a second ago. Prior to instructional materials review, Training should help staff and instructional materials committee members identify bias. The committee members need to be aware of their own biases and any experiences which may influence their choice of instructional materials. I've listed here a couple of options that you might want to take a look at. Uh, one from Teaching Tolerance, the other from Unbound Ed. These are absolutely not the only options out there, just some examples that your team might want to consider. Before you actually dive into using the screening tool with your team, um, have everybody read the screening tool criteria, um, the examples, and the scoring criteria really well. Be sure to uh, discuss any statement or term that requires some additional clarity or deeper understanding. We've included a glossary at the back of this resource um, in the hopes that it might help with some of that. The way the screening tool is set up is that um, it's been divided into topical sections, uh, each one with specific criteria. By the way, each of these sections has a link to additional criteria guidance and some examples and look fors uh, that might be helpful when you're looking at materials. For each of the criteria, reviewers are going to decide if it either meets, partially meets, or doesn't meet the criteria or if that particular criterion is not applicable. There are always going to be exceptions to these criteria. Instructional materials might be focused on a specific culture intentionally, or maybe there's just areas that are not relevant to the course. So as a team, you're going to want to discuss ahead of time when it's going to be appropriate to choose not applicable on the evaluation tool. One thing that is really critical is that um, after that score has been made, users provide evidence from the instructional material that supports that score. Um, and that's gonna be important when uh, later on you go to discuss those scores, you'll, you'll wanna have specifics that you can call out um, 
to provide evidence for your decision to choose that particular score. Finally, before you start, you'll want to make sure your review team is calibrated, that they understand the scoring system, uh, and that they practice on a sample document to make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of how they're going to review the material. Once all of that is under your belt, the reviewers can actually start evaluating the material, marking criteria as met, partially met, or not met, and remembering to provide a rationale for each response based on evidence from the instructional materials. Uh, in addition to just printing off copies of the screening tool for your review team, we also have a fillable form version if you'd like to keep your reviews digital. And I am going to include links to that fillable form version um, underneath this video as well. And the last step is an interpretation of the results. This is really not intended as a calculate the score, and if it meets 45, it's good, and if it's under 12, it's not kind of situation. Uh, instead, this is intended to spark conversations among your team. Areas marked as does not meet or partially meets are a launch point for further discussion. Some things to consider might be to find out if the criteria scored similarly among team members. If not, what accounts for the differences in scoring? Use reviewer identified evidence from the instructional materials to inform your discussion. And of course, be sure to flag any new considerations or concerns that arose out of the evaluation process and make sure to contact the publisher or developer if there's any additional information required in order to provide an accurate evaluation of the instructional material. So that was just a, a quick walkthrough of, of the process. Um, those are certainly all listed on the guidance document itself. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn you over to Arlene. You're going to want to make sure that the representation in the instructional material reflects the rich cultural diversity and lived experiences of all students. So here are some of the aspects of diversity that you should be considering as you review um, your materials in the screening tool. And then you're also going to want to make sure that you include other identifiers of students and families in your specific community. Uh, but also don't rule out the need for the inclusion of groups just because they are not reflected in your community. You're going to want to make sure that you are including diversity both of your community and of other communities as well. You'll need to look for stereotypes. Sometimes stereotypes are overt, for example, uh, depicting a male Latino teenager as a gang member. Other stereotypes may not be this obvious. So you're going to want to look for variations which may demean or exclude characters simply because of their race, their gender, or their sexual orientation. So you're really going to want to look through and see how um, peoples are represented in the materials and to make sure that they show a wide variety of roles and character traits, not just based on one specific aspect of who they are. And now I'll pass it on to Era for some additional considerations. So as we look at now this next criteria of multiple perspectives and contributions, we encourage you to think of this criteria of thinking about who is telling the story, who, um, who, which main voice is being um, elevated above others, and which perspectives might be missing, and which um, might have, which do have really valuable insight into such as a shared historical experience. We also encourage you um, to think about how you are infusing and integrating our tribally developed curriculum since time immemorial. As you can see here, an expectation of state statute. This encourages schools and districts to partner with tribal and Native American communities to think about the experiences of those tribes and communities within the region of that school and how they contribute to the history of Washington state. So as we look at these example look for us, we think about how do the instructional materials feature the stories and histories of, of people? And also how does it recognize the validity and integrity of our funds of knowledge and our different perspectives? Next, we also think about 
how we how we look at multicultural representation. Are we thinking about um, the opportunity that our students are able to see themselves and also to learn about different communities and cultures and people through their instructional materials? It's the ideas we like to say through ELA, the windows and mirrors um, theory, being able to see themselves reflected, but also being able to look out and to learn something new. So how, do, how, is, how are those different um, communities and cultures represented in the instructional materials and are they not and are we ensuring that they're not reinforcing stereotypes or common misinformed tropes and then finally we look at this next criteria of imagery and language as we think about the fact that as we look at instructional materials it's not just the words on the page it's the historical documents it's the images it's the cartoons it's the drawings it's the photographs it might be journal um, journal entries, it might be old newspapers. We want to make sure that our students are having access to those resources, but we also encourage you to think about how do we talk with our students if these are historical documents that might reinforce antiquated views or ideas or prejudice, and how, how do we advance that and look at how far we have come. So perfect example as we look at these example look for us, we think about characters of a diverse and cultural backgrounds are not represented stereotypically, are presented as foreign or exotic. Are the images of American Indians and Alaska Native people, including photos and illustrations in a contemporary, in contemporary context? And finally, are there illustrations of children shown wearing a variety of colors and um, of clothing, colors and hairstyles that show them all engaged in the different activities that just go beyond our traditional gender expectations and roles. So we really want to kind of show this and make sure we pay attention as much to the visual as we do to the written um, pieces of the instructional materials. Next, I'm going to pass it over to Lori, who's going to take you through a couple of more pieces of the criteria within the tool. Thank you. So this next uh, piece is about family representation. And obviously, we have a wide variety of families represented in all of our communities throughout the state. And um, it's important to make sure that students see their own families represented um, in any materials that are used in the classroom, including um, sensitivity to diversity and family dynamics. So not just the makeup of the, the family itself, but how family members interact with each other and what students experience is on a day-to-day -day basis. So while this slide is relevant to all content areas, I have some content specific examples for sexual health education, because I think it's especially important in several regards. Um, Washington has had a requirement since 2007 that instructional materials are inclusive of all students, regardless of protected class. And so that includes um, families who may have same sex parents, um, students who may be um, LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and so forth. Um, this requirement will continue with new legislation that's going into place um, in December this year, 2020, regarding sexual health education. Um, we have a specific review process for sexual health education materials, and that process does include criteria related to bias, and we'll be updating our process to include this new rubric. Some examples of look for's in sexual health materials include representations of effective and healthy marriage that include more than the traditional male and female model. Um, we want to avoid derogatory and shaming language in reference to sexual activity, whether students have engaged in sexual behavior voluntarily or involuntarily. We don't know exactly what's going on with students, and the last thing we want to do is shame them or re-traumatize them um, in any way. We also want to make sure that students with disabilities are included when discussing romantic relationships and sexual health. This is a, a very often left out aspect of um, life among people with disabilities. And I'll just reiterate that Finding and using diverse instructional materials provides an additional opportunity to support students in feeling both comfortable with and proud of their families of origin and their own identities. This work reinforces social emotional learning standards and benchmarks um, as well. <laughs> 
We want to make sure that review team members um, review teachers materials for the instructional uh, materials as well. So not just the, the materials that will be presented to students, but what sort of preparation or background information um, instructions are teachers getting. And so this might include both a teacher's manual as well as any teacher guidance within the individual units or lesson plans. So look fors in this area are guidance on how to approach, enhance, and customize lessons for their student populations, um, making sure that diverse student identities are seen as assets and strengths that can advance individual and group learning rather than challenges or difficulties to be overcome. And when, appro when appropriate, the instructional materials should provide guidance on how to make connections between academic content and the local neighborhood culture, environment, and resources, including guidance on sources for valid non-traditional resources if available. And once this objective review has been completed, educators will want to engage in a more subjective conversation about how materials might be used most effectively in their own district and community. So that gets at that second bullet point about making connections between the content and the local community. Okay, I will add final words on the non-discrimination requirements in Washington. As it's already been stated in this presentation, reviewing instructional material, instructional materials for bias is a requirement. Um, it's specifically a requirement in our state's civil rights laws. Washington law requires schools to eliminate discrimination, including in textbooks and instructional materials. And in Washington, um, discrimination is prohibited based on several protected classes, including sex, race, religion, color, national origin, sexual orientation, gender expression, gender identity, and disability as examples. So the criteria in this tool were specifically designed to be in response to these protected classes in our state. So schools can use this tool as part of their work to ensure that classrooms are free from bias and discrimination. And as a reminder, the, the requirement is not aimed only at um, ensuring diversity and representation in our instructional materials, but also ensuring that the materials we use do not promote bias or discrimination, um, which could include biased ideas, stereotypes, or derogatory language or images. Thanks so much. Well, as has been mentioned uh, multiple times, this is a living document. This is version 1.0. We would greatly appreciate um, your feedback, your experiences with using the, the tool with your, your district. There is a link to a, um, a feedback survey, and uh, we certainly hope that you take the time to, to fill that out and provide uh, your, your comments and, and your guidance for future iterations. With that, I am going to thank all of my colleagues for, uh, for joining me today uh, to introduce this tool to folks. I'm going to end here on OSPI's equity statement and just uh, wish everyone a uh, good afternoon or morning or whenever it happens to be when you're listening to this. Um, thanks for joining us. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions and do take a moment to fill in that feedback tool as well. Thanks so much. Uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.